Okay then, shall we, um, shall we get started? Yes. Right, okay. <laughs> um, well, I'd just like to start the, um, the event today by welcoming everybody and thanking everybody for making the effort to come today at what is the first of a series of lectures, Florence Nightingale Foundation lectures that are going to be hosted here in Manchester. And this is a, a tripartite arrangement between the School of Nursing, Midwifery and Social Work at the University of Manchester, the um, Central uh, Manchester University's Foundation Trust and the Florence Nightingale Foundation. Um, I'd like to start by offering Karen Lucas apologies for a head of school at the university. Unfortunately, she was called away at short notice and so isn't able to chair the event today. Um, so what I'm going to do is just do a brief welcome and hand over to Liz Robb, who is the Chief Executive of the Florence Nightingale Foundation, who's going to chair the event um, uh, today. Um, so um, thanks everybody for being here, as I said, and I'd like to give a, a big thank you to everybody who's made this event possible. So Liz Robb from the Foundation, um, uh, Jill Heaton and Sue Ward from the Trust, and Karen Luke from the University, and of course thank Davina Allen for being here and making the journey from, from South Wales today. Um, just to introduce Davina, she is um, a Professor of Healthcare Organisation at the University of Cardiff. She's an adult nurse by training and uh, trained in Cambridge. Her academic background is in sociology. She has a degree and a PhD in sociology, which she obtained from Nottingham University. And her area of research is in healthcare organisation. Um, and she's particularly interested and passionate about the role of nursing within healthcare systems. And she's recently um, completed um, a Health Foundation Improvement Science Fellowship, and I think some of that work is going to form the basis of her lecture today. Um, so just to let you know that this is the first in a series of lectures. We're aiming to have about three or four a year um, over the next few years. Um, and we do have a list of the initial speakers around for people today. We're going to alternate venues between the university and the trust and try and um, sort of tinker with the times to make them as accessible to as many people as possible. So um, I think that's, that's enough by way of introduction. Um, uh, I didn't introduce myself, did I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, Angela Todd. I've got the Florence Nightingale Foundation Chair in Clinical Nursing Practice Research here at um, Manchester. It's a joint post between the Trust and the University and the Florence Nightingale Foundation. Okay, so um, I'll now hand over to Liz Robb, who is going to chair the rest of the event today. Okay. Thank you very much, Angela, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Angela said, I'm Elizabeth Robb, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Florence Nightingale Foundation. And our whole aspiration in the Foundation, for those of you who don't know about us, you will have heard the name Florence Nightingale, is around maintaining the legacy of Florence Nightingale. Now, I've always said that Florence Nightingale was the original healthcare researcher, because had it not been for her coxcomb diagram and her first use of pie charts ever to demonstrate that people were dying far more frequently from infection than they were from their actual wounds on the battlefield, then there wouldn't have been this huge change in the way hospitals were organised, supplied, the actual importance of the environment and cleanliness in healthcare. And that is a very, very long time ago. And yet so many of her teachings are still alive today. The Foundation gives scholarships to nurses and one of the areas that we give scholarships in are research scholarships. It is my belief and that of the Foundation and its trustees that research is the seed corn of our future and that building capacity and capability in nursing and midwifery research is so terribly important for us to be able to evidence what's the best care and to ensure that we can compete at the table with other healthcare colleagues who have 
claims to most of the original evidence, not that I'm suggesting any one particular profession may be responsible for that, but nurses and midwives, I lay out the challenge, need to up their game. The chairs, as we have developed them, are absolutely in the Florence Nightingale mode, in that they are based in clinical practice, and they have the requirement to undertake research in clinical practice that is relevant. I'm delighted to tell you that last week we appointed our seventh such chair at the University of West of England, and one of our chairs is associated with the University of Cambridge. Now, before you all jump down here and say, there's no undergraduate nursing at the University of Cambridge, you're absolutely right, there isn't because that 800-year-old university that is thought to be still at the top of the tree in the world did not think it was important to have an undergraduate nursing school. But we've made jolly sure now that they have a professor of nursing research as part of Cambridge University, which I think is a real achievement um, as part of the Florence Nightingale Foundation Collaborative. Angela is based here, as you've seen, and... Uh, our intention is to develop 12 and to create a faculty of a virtual faculty across the UK of some of the best brains and nursing researchers so that we can start to apply ourselves in answering some of these key questions that are being thrown at nursing. And Angela and her colleagues who are already appointed, those of you who don't but should read the British Journal of Nursing, which comes out each month, are writing a whole set of opinions around some of the key areas of nursing um, as a collaborative. And the first one, it's no accident that it's a, a, a defense of the fact that you can be intelligent and compassionate at the same time. And to try and bust this myth that the only thing that's wrong with nursing is that we're graduates, and if we'd have probably stayed in our box, things would have been very different. Most people haven't seen the requirements of care that we meet every day in healthcare in whatever setting. So that's a little bit about our aspirations in research. I have put around uh, a flyer about our conference, which is coming up. Never miss an opportunity, those of you who don't know me. Um, but I do never miss an opportunity. It's on the 12th and 13th of March. It's in London, and that's not because we're London-centric. It's because most people can get to London from Northern Ireland and Scotland and wherever more easily than they can to Liverpool or Birmingham. So it's based in London, 12th, 13th of March. It's cheap as chips, and we have some cracking speakers, including, I was just telling one of my colleagues here, the, we've just been informed that the Director of Nursing from the Virginia Mason Medical Center in Seattle, you know, the one that Jeremy Hunt went to and did his speech about how fantastic they are and we should all be like them, is going to come and do one of our master classes at the conference. And we also have the author of a book called Willful Blindness. Those of you who read the Financial Times, it's in the top 10. And it's about organizations that know there's a problem but actually don't pick up and do anything about it. And of course, the Francis Inquiry was all about that. And some of you will know other examples. So we've got some really good speakers and I would very much commend to you to come. And for those of you who'd never heard of the foundation before, don't be bashful, I'm not going to ask you to stand up or put your hand up, but I've left some brochures on the front. So please take one when you go because applying for a scholarship is quite easy. It's not difficult to get one. Nurses are very underconfident about getting scholarships. It's not difficult, it's not complicated, and there aren't people better than you. There are people in this room who've just been given one, and those who are alumni, including myself, and I didn't think I was good enough to get one, so there you are. And I liked it so much, I bought the company, as they say. So please do think about applying. We're always keen to get new applicants, and I'm sure many of your colleagues over tea can tell you about the benefits of it. So without further ado, I'm going to start. We're early, so that gives a little bit more time perhaps for questions and a cup of tea and generally a bit of neighboring afterwards. 
And I would like to just add to this. Davina spoke about two years ago at our Florence Nightingale Foundation conference, and I was blown away with this work. I think it is the most seminal piece of work in nursing that actually analyzes what nursing work is. No pressure, Davina. Um, <laughs> It's true. I mean, I think we are humbled to have her as the first in this series because everybody in this country thinks they know what nurses do. From the Prime Minister to everyone, everyone has an opinion on what a good nurse is, does, looks like, and what nursing work should be and what it isn't. And what Davina is going to share with us today is actually what it is and the pivotal importance of nursing. So I really commend her to you. Thank you so much, Davina. Okay. Well, thank you, Liz. Um, no pressure, as you say. Um, good afternoon, and thank you, everyone, for coming. It's um, very reassuring to see so many people here, and thank you to Angela for inviting me to kick off this event. It is a real, real honour. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. Louder? Louder? Microphone? Is that better? Yeah? I'm not very tall. I should have worn my heels. What I um, want to do this afternoon is to share with you some headline messages from um, a recently completed piece of research on a relatively neglected aspect of nursing practice, and that's the contribution that nurses make to everyday healthcare organisation, or what I've called organising work. What I want to do is to describe some of the characteristics of this work, which I hope will be familiar to you, and then to highlight um, the contribution that this work makes to the quality and safety of patient care. And what I hope we can do together at the end of the um, presentation in our discussions is think through some of the implications of this work and actually the so what question, where do we, where do we take this from now? Okay, so nursing is typically understood and understand itself as a caregiving profession. So it's through our relationships with patients that modern day nursing is defined. And of course, when society becomes concerned about the care of its citizens, it's nurses that are held to account. We saw this very clearly in the aftermath of the um, Francis report where despite the multiplicity of sector-wide factors that um, were identified as contributing to the mid-staff scandal. It was nurses who were pilloried in the press. And I think what was so striking about this public onslaught was that the profession seemed so unable to marshal a convincing public response. Now, of course, it's incredibly difficult to defend poor nursing care and I don't think anybody could fail to be shocked by the picture that emerged from Francis but I think the issue is is more complex than that um, I think one of the challenges that the nursing leadership faced in the wake of the criticisms that arose from Francis was this growing gap between how the profession thinks about and describes its practice and as a consequence how society and politicians understand nursing and then the reality of nursing work in contemporary healthcare systems. So over the last 40 years or so, nursing's professional mandate, by which I mean the sorts of claims we make um, to society about the contribution that we're making, our mandate's been typically expressed in terms of a distinctive holistic approach to care. So this is very much a professional model of practice underpinned by a logic that emphasises the primacy of nurse-patient relationships and the exercise of professional judgement in meeting the singular needs of individuals. But of course, whilst we've been pursuing a professional identity based on this professional logic, <coughs> healthcare organisations are increasingly being driven, driven by managerialism and managerialist logics which emphasise efficiency, 
rational legal forms of decision making, standardisation of work processes and performance review. Against this backdrop, research regularly reveals that contemporary nursing practice bears only a fleeting resemblance to the profession's patient-centred ideals. And it's not simply that nurses are increasingly distant from direct care delivery, although I'm sure most of you would recognise this to be the case. It's also true that nurses are undertaking a wide range of activities that contribute importantly and positively to the quality and safety of patient care, but which are not captured by this prevailing professional image of nurses as caregiver. And in fact, we actually lack a language with which to describe these elements of the nursing function, which is why I've coined this term, organising work. Now, if you look at research on nursing work, what you typically find is that studies are informed by what I call a deficit model. And by this, I mean that they tend to focus on problematizing the gap between our professional ideals and nurses' actual practice. And their aim is always to seek ways of addressing this mismatch. So what is interesting, I think, is that although some people have estimated that organizing work can, can take up to 70% of the work that nurses actually do. It's never been studied in its own right. It's only ever been seen as a distraction from the real work of nursing, which is direct care delivery. So in my work, I've tended to take a different approach. I, I try to move away from the assumption that we can define the essence of nursing in some predetermined way. And my approach is to focus instead on the work that nurses actually do and the circumstances that make that work necessary. So what do you see on the slide there? Do you see a vase or do you see two faces? Of course, this is the famous optical illusion, the Rubin vase, and it's often used to, to illustrate the concept of figure and ground. So depending on whether the white or the black colour is seen as the figure or the background, then the brain will interpret the picture as two different images. And the idea is that it's probably difficult, or in some cases impossible, to see both of those images at the same time. What I want to do today is to bring about a figure ground reversal in the way in which we see nursing, and to place direct patient care for the moment into the background and bring to the foreground this other aspect of, of the nursing role, the, the organising work. So what I'm going to be doing is drawing on a research study um, which was carried out, or at least the data collection was carried out in the um, spring and summer of 2011, um, during which time I shadowed 40 adult-based adult hospital nurses who were working in clinically focused roles in order to examine their organising work. So I wasn't looking at nurse managers, I was looking at nurses in clinical roles. Um, the main sources of data that I generated were observations, um, ethnographic interviews, which are the sorts of informal conversations that you have with people while you're watching them work, and I also collected data on the tools and the, the kind of documents and stuff that nurses use to support their practice. So I was very much concerned with what it was that nurses were doing, what the resources were they used to do this work, and what that could tell me about the knowledge and skills that underpinned their practice. My findings suggest that in the hospital context, at least, and this, just, this is just about the hospital context, um, that nurses organising work can be thought of as <coughs> comprised of four interconnected domains of practice, and I want to sort of take you through each of those um, in the next section of my um, presentation, and as I said, try and tease out some of their implications for the quality and safety of patient care. Before I do so, I just want to um, say a quick word on terminology. There's not, I am a sociologist, but there's not going to be too much theory in this, I promise. Um, I'm going to be using this notion of a care trajectory, and what I'm using that to refer to is both the unfolding health and social care needs of patients, but also the total organisation of work that's associated with attending to those needs. Gosh. OK. 
Okay, so the, the first domain of practice relates to the work that nurses do to support information flows. Healthcare is knowledge intensive work, but as you all know, I'm sure, there are tremendous challenges to um, knowledge sharing. We're very fond of using the notion of team in the context of healthcare, but if you think about it, in reality, um, service providers are often making largely independent contributions to patient care. We were having that conversation earlier this, um, today. Um, and, and their work tends to be spread across time and space. It's also the case that each um, contributor is operating with a slightly different view and arguably a partial view of the patient which reflects their own particular work purposes. The demands of knowledge sharing are compounded by the fact that patient trajectories are often evolving in ways that are um, not predictable um, or certain. What's interesting, I think, is that despite this complexity, this fragmentation and uncertainty, it's pretty rare that all providers in a given patient's care actually come together for the purposes of sharing um, their knowledge or negotiating their respective contributions. Of course, we have ward rounds and team meetings, and these are important, undoubtedly, but compared to the speed with which trajectories evolve, they're relatively infrequent events, and I think it's also the case that they're rarely attended by everybody um, involved in a given case. So one of the things that nurses are doing an awful lot of is to mediate the communication flows between different care providers. And a principal way in which this is happening is through the generation and circulation of what I've called um, trajectory narratives. I'm sure these will be familiar to you. These are the stories that we share with each other that encapsulate what's happening to the patient, what's known, what's unknown, what's planned, what we need to find out. And these tend to be generated in the first instance when nurses enter, um, sorry, when patients are admitted to a service and then set into circulation through the nursing handover. And they're the sorts of things that certainly in the study site were recorded in a summary form, what I called a plot summary on scraps of paper that nurses carry around in their pocket. So these summaries are very much focusing as a portable patient record, if you like, um, an aid memoir, and importantly, they can be really easily updated. Um, and that's an important point because trajectory narratives are constantly on the move, being revised as part of everyday activity. So we've got nurses who are checking out details in the medical record, phoning around to clarify issues, um, changing um, the direction of a tra tra trajectory on the basis of uh, decisions that are made at ward rounds or in discussions with families, the whole raft of people that are involved in um, a given patient's care. What I want to stress is that this isn't just a case of accumulating information. So decisions are having to be made about what information to um, take note of and what to ignore. Um, nurses appear to have an, an antennae for inconsistencies in a story where certain aspects of it just don't stack up and it indicates the need to find out more. And all of this involves what the um, social psychologist Carl Weick has called sense-making. So the idea here is that nurses are not acting as some kind of team memory in, in um, creating this knowledge. They're actually generating the, the narratives that support the ongoing work activity. And in the study site, certainly, there was nowhere anywhere in the formal information um, infrastructure, the medical record, the whiteboards, all the checklists, there was nowhere anywhere that that encapsulated story of what was going on with patients on a given moment, on a given day, could be um, located. This was something that nurses were generating through their practice. The final point I want to make is that these stories are not shared in the same way with all audiences. So what I observed was that nurses were modifying their content depending on who the audience was for them. So they're translating them, if you like. And this requires an enormous amount of skill because it requires you to understand the perspective of the person that you're sharing the story with. And it requires you to understand the knowledge or the information they need in order to do their work. So. And I guess the point is that this is resource intensive, um, demanding work. So 
This is subtle. These are really subtle practices. This is work that's woven through the fabric of everyday nursing activity, where you have a question that arises in one context, almost being transformed into an answer in another, in an almost continuous flow. This is without doubt hugely consequential for the quality and safety of patient care, and it also requires time, skill, and resources. Have you had a chance to read that? Sorry, am I? <coughs> Wave at me at the back if I'm going quiet again. Okay. The um, second set of organising practices is the work that nurses do to articulate um, trajectories of care by ensuring that the different actions, people and mat uh, materials are lined up in the right order, um, in the right place, at the right time. Let's just start this section with a story. This is um, from the um, Patient Stories um, website. And it's the story of Julie Carman, who in 2008 was involved in a road traffic accident. She suffered injuries to her face, her jaw and her legs, um, but nevertheless made a um, good initial recovery and thought she'd be back at work within three months. Three years later, she was still undergoing treatment, having had two emergency admissions to hospital with acute cellulitis and sepsis. It was a series of what Julie describes as everyday communication failures that conspired to create delays in her treatment. She simply didn't get antibiotics when they were needed, and she believes that this led to her slower physical recovery. As she describes, it wasn't that individual care providers were uncaring, it was simply that her care fell through the gaps. Um, in the system, and it's those gaps in the system that articulation work is intended um, to prevent. You think I was running out of water? <laughs> so this, this idea of articulation work, it's not mine. It was coined by the um, American sociologist Anselm Strauss um, in a groundbreaking study of the social organization of medical work. It comes from the um, term um, articulus, which is the Latin term for um, small joint, and, the, it, the, and this refers to the kind of act of connecting things together to allow movement. So the idea of articulation work is that it refers to the, all the additional work that's needed in complex organisational processes to make sure that all the elements and the components um, cohere. It's the work that supports the work, if you like, and again, it requires skills and resources over and above the immediate task at hand. So the nurses um, in my study undertook three different kinds of articulation work. They undertook temporal artic articulation work, which was directed at ensuring that things happened at the appropriate time and in the right order. So they were very much drawing on these trajectory narratives, their understanding of the evolving um, process of somebody's care, combining that with organisational knowledge so they could anticipate what would unfold so that the arrangements could be made in place to make sure that things happened when they should do. They also undertook material articulation, so this is making sure that the materials are available to support the work. An awful lot of the safety literature is showing that a lot of the safety problems that we have are, are arising because the kit isn't in place when it's needed to um, support action. And nurses were supporting this in two ways. Firstly, just through the routine work that they did to maintain the clinical environment, making sure equipment was, a fun was functioning and stores were stocked, those kinds of things. But secondly, the work that they did on a situational basis to support specific actions. And so this is particularly important when um, people were operating under pressures of work, when action was time critical, or, as is often the case, staff were unfamiliar where stuff was kept um, in a particular unit. Um, In addition to the work that nurses did to facilitate action, um, trajectory articulation also required um, some attention to the way in which elements of a particular course of action or whatever cohered. So 
As I've said, healthcare providers interact relatively infrequently, and nurses have an important role in mediating these relationships. So they're operating with an overview of an overall patient's trajectory of care, which makes them very well placed to recognise when a decision that's made in one context, which seems perfectly reasonable, is actually highly consequential for a decision that's being made elsewhere. So they have an important role in supporting um, joined up decision making and resolving contradictory elements in an individual's care. So you can see the example there is where separate teams have made a decision about somebody's blood glucose monitoring, which neither, neither of whom know anything about. So taken together then, this aspect of nurses' practice made an important um, contribution to what seems to be the holy, holy grail of healthcare quality, which is to ensure that you've got the right person in the right place doing the right thing at the right time. And that's what a lot of these shiny improvement technologies are designed to do, but actually this is what nurses are doing on an everyday basis. My third domain of practice I've called matchmaking, and, and I'm using this to refer to the work that nurses do in matching patients with beds. Hospitals have this daily challenge of making sure that um, they're both balancing this demand of an unknown and variable um, volume of patients, but ensuring that they have a sufficient but not excessive number of beds available for individuals with differing needs. Now, historically, doctors have controlled their own beds, and then in the late 1980s, we saw the introduction of sort of centralised bed management and the use of um, bed managers, many of whom were actually nurses. Um, increasingly, however, in today's NHS, or certainly in the study site, the work of managing beds and patient flows is actually being distributed across the entire organisation, and certainly um, here it was nurses who, from ward to board, were responsible for managing um, beds and flows through the system. Um, <clears throat> I knew I was going to have trouble with this thing. But what is a bed? This is a simple question for which there's a very complex answer. Even if we limited our discussion to the kind of material artifact, we discover a wide variety. We've got hospital beds, and intelligent beds, pediatric beds, bariatric beds, low-rise beds. Trolleys can be used as beds, but only for certain kinds of patients and for certain periods of time. Beds are associated with different kinds of expertise, equipment and infrastructure such as your ITU beds and your cardiology beds. And even within the same department, not all beds are equal. You have certain beds that are more or less suitable for different kinds of patients. I could go on, but I think the point is that beds are actually a complex currency. And nurses were required to understand this in order to optimise their use in the areas in which they worked. So what I observed was an awful lot of work going on throughout the organisations where nurses were drawing on their fine-grained understanding of the local bed economies in which they worked and combining this with their clinical knowledge in order to match individual patients with beds and process patient flows. So here we've got an extract where the um, um, emergency unit coordinator um, is trying to move flows through the EU and uh, the doctor volunteers a patient to go to the um, medical assessment unit and you can see that she translates the clinical information um, provided, the tachycardia, no precipitating factors, into the kind of bed that's going to be required. Um, so it will need monitoring and of course this limits the beds that the patient can be placed into those with cardiac monitors. I, I suspect the same is here. The pressure on the beds in the study sites in the study site were horrendous, and in such circumstances, matching patients with beds you know when, when there are loads of beds available it 's not that difficult to put patients in beds, but when you 're struggling to squeeze people into the system, it requires very careful, skilled clinical judgments and negotiations and accommodations where patient needs being tweaked or beds are being tweaked in order to maximise the quality of care for individuals on the one hand whilst trying to meet the organisation's responsibility for maximising bed utilisation on the other. So here we have an example where the discharge liaison um, nurse is trying to call in a favour with a nursing home and get them to accept a heavily dependent patient into a room that's actually too small to accommodate a hoist on the grounds that this patient doesn't actually get out of bed so won't need a hoist and that's a kind of just a way to try and 
move him through the system. These sorts of negotiations were going on all over the place on an everyday basis in which nurses were forever trying to balance these different um, demands. And uh, my, I guess my, my point is if this is bed management, this is a very different picture from the notions of efficiency and centralised control through which management is conventionally understood. This is very much more about situated, clinically informed, context-dependent judgments taken by staff in the moment doing the best they can in conditions of time pressure and resource scarcity. And then the final domain of practice is um, related to the work that nurses do in managing transfers of care. Again, this will be familiar to you. Healthcare is becoming increasingly specialised and as bed pressures increase, patients typically move across different departments and services, um, even within a single inpatient episode and of course every time they move from a different department to another um, there are always risks to the quality and safety of their care. Now within the professional and policy literature boundary crossing or transfers of care is often conceptualized as a process in which patients simply transferred from one service to another with success believed to hinge on role clarity and accurate information exchange. So in the quote that you have on the slide there, the, there's, the analogy is drawn between transfers of care and the requirements for a smooth baton exchange in a relay race. My findings suggest that we perhaps need to think about these things slightly differently. Not this differently. But, um, this, is, uh, this is a publicity shot of Marilyn Monroe. It was taken by um, Jean Corman for the film Niagara in 1952, 53. And when Marilyn Monroe died in 1962, Andy Warhol used this image as the basis for a series of um, silkscreen representations of the icon. That's an example. What I'd like to suggest is that the transformation that takes place from one different colour control to the next illustrates powerfully the processes involved in transfers of care which depend for their success on far more than a clear division of labour and robust systems of communication as implied by the baton exchange model. What I'd like to suggest is that in order for the baton to be passed it's necessary for patient identities to be passed and what I'm Using this notion here, it's in the same way that it's used in um, computing to refer to the process where the course code of a computer program has to first be analysed and translated before it's turned into a machine code. So I think we've got a similar process going on here at service interfaces in which um, patients have to be translated, if you like, from the work object of one service into the work object of another in order for care to be transferred. So it's not just what I've been doing for the patient in my unit, I need to understand what you need to know about that patient to do the work of your unit. So if you recall the observations I made about the role of nurses in supporting information flows, what I tried to convey there was the sense of the fluidity of patient trajectories and their dynamic and changing nature. So they're always on the move, if you like. But of course, when it comes to transfer of care, trajectory narratives have to be stabilised and work needs to be done to formalise the patient's trajectory and its history to date. So that extract on the slide there is taken from observations of a staff nurse completing a discharge referral letter to the community nursing team, a very ordinary, everyday um, practice. But what you can see there that this is very much a retrospective process in which the meaning of what's happened to the patient is actually accomplished after the event. What's also interesting is just how difficult it is to do this on the basis of the medical record because this doesn't include any such encapsulation of what's gone on with the patient. So in this case, the um, nurse has to ask a colleague. Once stabilised, transfers of care also requ require patients to be reassembled, if you like, into the work object of a new service. This is very much about packaging patients and their identities into a form which enables the receiving department to do its job. So this second example is from the short-stay surgical unit, and it refers to the process of transferring patients to the operating theatre. There are just a few points I want to draw out here. 
Firstly, this is a highly selective representation of the patient. It reflects operating theatre work. So, whilst it's important to know about the existence of allergies, when the patient last ate, whether they have dental caps or crowns, there's no information here on their social circumstances, their mobility, their hobbies, dietary preferences, or any of the other details which make up individuals and might be relevant in addressing their needs um, in another part of the service. Those aspects of patients' identities are simply not relevant for the work of theatre staff. Secondly, it's clear that documents are significant in mediating these processes, and these were a primary source of the paperwork about which nurses complained. Um, in the study site, when nurses transferred from one department to another or a different organisation, it normally meant that they started an entirely new set of paperwork. This meant that not only were transfers of care more onerous than they needed to be, they are also arguably more error prone because things get lost in translation or don't get transcribed across properly. There's also a tendency for staff to see this simply as more paperwork rather than a really important service process which can have enormous consequences for patients if we get it wrong. Finally, all too often this was work that was subject to constant interruptions. Interestingly, in the study site when nurses gave out medications, they wore these little red tabards with do not disturb. Um, and although my understanding is that the evidence base to, um, to demonstrate the effectiveness of tabards in reducing interruptions at me for medication rounds is flaky, the point is the risks involved with those processes were recognised. And yet paperwork, the, the consequences of getting the paperwork wrong are arguably no less no more, no less serious, and yet it wasn't seen in the same way. And in fact, far from um, nurses being um, the case being made for nurses to be given quiet spaces in order to do this work, what we saw at the time that I was doing this study was calls to ban nurses' stations and put nurses right back into the clinical care areas, where of course they're going to be interrupted um, even more. So. What does all this amount to? Um, the last couple of slides, what I just want to do is to try and summarise um, what this work suggests about the role that nurses occupy within um, contemporary healthcare systems and also perhaps what healthcare systems look like when they're seen through the lens of the nurses' work. And then hopefully we can open this up for some discussions about what all of this amounts to. Nurses aren't typically regarded as the primary players in healthcare systems. It's doctors, isn't it, who are accorded um, that accolade. But what I want to suggest is, is that through their organising work, nurses are the means for bringing together and keeping apart all the different elements through which service delivery is accomplished. There's hardly anything that happens in healthcare that doesn't pass through the hands of a nurse. Nurses are what the actor network theorists call the obligatory passage points in healthcare system. Now, an obligatory passage point can be thought of as the narrow end of a funnel which forces everything to kind of move through it. So it forces um, actors to converge on a particular topic or purpose or a question. So what I'd like to suggest is that through all this organising work, nurses are funnelling, refracting and shaping all the activity that contributes to patient care. Um, I've started to call this process translational mobilisation. I know it's a bit of a mouthful, but what I'm trying to do is to capture something of the mediating role that nurses are performing here in bringing together all the components of care, but also something of the energy that nurses are injecting into healthcare systems and the fact that this is work that is, con is, is involved and it's continuous. It's very much part of the fabric of nursing activity. And when you look at healthcare systems from the vantage point of nurses, the image that emerges is not one of rationally ordered, um, laminated pathways of unitary individuals through the service. They're very much more stochastic, chaotic, amorphous, distributed processes in which patient identities are being shaped and reshaped according to the purposes at hand. It's a very different picture. 
Now, of course, all organisations have a tendency to overestimate their orderliness, and by this I mean the extent to which they believe their activities to be governed by rational processes and systems, the care pathways, the care plans, the care bundles. And it's these systems that tend to be um, held responsible and given credit for an organisation's success. What I'd like to suggest is that Despite their appearance of laminated rationality, insofar as healthcare exhibits any order, we should think of this as a nursing order. Thank you very much. Here's my acknowledgements. Well, thank you so much. Um, See what I mean? Really interesting take on how important nursing work is and how much of it's really invisible. So this is such a huge opportunity to ask Davina some questions. So I'm assuming we're going to have someone running about with mics or... Yes, are we? Fantastic. Well, we're going to try. And um, what I'd like you to do is say, stick your hand up, say who you are and where you're from. And then I'm sure Davina will be delighted to answer any questions. Yes? Yeah, and, and, and can, I, can I just say that I see this as very foundational work. It's the, first, it's the first go at having a look at some of this stuff. And one of the things I'm absolutely passionate about is how do we make this sort of stuff have an impact on practice. So if you have any views on the relevance and the implications of this, I have my pencil there ready to take notes. Brilliant. So she wants to learn from us, I think, is the bottom line as well. So you look like a very intelligent bunch to me. So what contributions would you like to make? Anybody prepared to put their hand up? Oh, great. Well, as we don't seem to have anybody running, can you stand up and shout? like um, how we measure acuity and dependency and um, even in some of the lean thinking which is around direct patient care etc if you go back to the 80s when we did some of the other work and I've forgotten the title for it that was led from Leeds it was all about di direct patient care and indirect care being of non-value added and what we always say here is the indirect is not non-value added so we do say this is value added care but I think it would be really interesting, it's not going to happen tomorrow, I know, is how you take some of this and add it to the work around the Safer Nursing Care tool that looks about maybe how do you start to add this as value-added work to the patient journey. How do you measure it? Mm. Do you want to come back on that or do you just want to add it to your to-do list? I'll add it to my to-do list. But, um, yes, yeah, certainly one of, the, one, of, one of my aspirations would be how do you measure this? And then how do you fact that into, factor that into your staffing levels? I mean, one of, one of the um, things I reflected back to the trust where, where this work was undertaken was would, would there be a way of measuring the articulation or the organising burden in a particular clinical setting? And that might start to make your staffing profile look slightly different in terms of the demands of all this kind of work. Um, the thing is, we do measure it to degrees with those tools, yeah. but we don't... No. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And given the nice work and various other things, we need. This is why I said this was such a seminal piece. By virtue of the fact that so much of what we do as nur as nurses, as Davina said, is about morphing into the glue that keeps everything else running translating things from one step in the system to another and when that falls down that's when everything goes bums up basically whether that's the fact that somebody doesn't get antibiotics fast enough I mean there's a raft of stories around sepsis you know that somebody comes they do exactly that they prescribe the antibiotics oh well the doctor hasn't we haven't started the line oh they didn't do it oh this pharmacy didn't send the right antibiotics up we can go on forever and before you know where you are you've lost 48 hours and they're actually almost moribund 
And we know the consequences of that, and yet these sorts of things still happen. Um. Hi, I'm Anne Cooper, and I work in informatics, and I, I guess I'm intrigued by the tension that I see, whether it's real or not, or whether it's my own tension, between how we describe nursing, how we present ourselves to the public and as a profession, and what you're saying that we actually do. I believe your story of what we actually do. I remember that story from when I was a ward sister. Now, I've always believed that ward managers, nurses who were managers, nurses who did skill mix, etc., etc., were adding real value to the system, but we don't tend to talk about it in quite the same way. And I'm intrigued as to how much of this is cultural as, that w exists within us as opposed to an external thing that's being done to us. It's a complex question. I think, I think there are several issues there. I think, A, it's really difficult to encapsulate in a way that speaks to the public the breadth of work that nurses do in the whole diversity of contexts in which nursing works. I think we're ambivalent ourselves as a profession about this aspect of our practice. Many of the people that I followed were quite apologetic about it, saw it as taking them away from direct patient care, and, and, um, and yet rallied when I sort of indicated that I considered it to be important. So I think we're ambivalent about it ourselves. So I think we do do it to ourselves a bit, but, but equally we, we talk about ourselves as, as direct carers, and so... You know, when we're sitting at desk with pieces of paper, people find it hard to understand what that work is that's being done. I also think that, the, that there isn't a deep appreciation of just how chaotic healthcare systems are. And, you know, you have to wonder if you told the public just how chaotic they were, whether they ever want to set foot in one. So, so it's very difficult. About it. It's a bit um, Everett Hughes sort of talks about... Um, um, guilty knowledge that you acquire as a member of a profession. So, like <coughs> undertakers under t un, um, acquire guilty knowledge about death and bodies, and police under un acquire guilty knowledge about the criminal underworld, and the sort of things we've acquired about our understanding of healthcare organisations, which you possibly find it difficult to share mm. with the wider public. I'm, I mean, one of the things that I would like us just to consider is this is almost reverse psychology because we've spent most of our careers apologising for not being at the bedside or, you know, the productive ward tries to maximise the amount of time that we should be with patients. I'm not suggesting we shouldn't be, but it, it's reverse psychology to what we're doing. I can remember one of those um, systems before the... Uh, I actually piloted the original Safer Nursing Care tool 100 years ago. Um, but before that, there was something called GRASP that was brought from America when I was working in Sheffield. And we brought it in. Anybody ever worked in Sheffield? We did it. It was a work study, and it was based on Pareto's law, um, that you add 20% in for everything else you're doing that you can't really measure, which was most of the stuff. So you just had this figure of 20%. Now, how many of you have heard of the Lord Carter Review? They're really looking at how they procure things in the NHS, but more importantly, how they reduce the agency bill as part of that. And they're about to be looking at work study and have exactly this premise. That, you know, it's the direct care that's important and all the rest is, you know, you just add a very small percentage in it because it's taking people away. So it might sound historic, but it's actually quite current. And we need to think about how we can rebalance I guess as a result of this the image and and the narrative we ourselves say about nursing and the importance of work question at the back there you might include because that that's one of the criticisms isn't it that this aspect of the nurse's role isn't seen of any value by the public, that nurses are talking and on the phone or at the nurse's station and not engaging in direct care. Yeah, well, I think, I think um, we have an important PR job to do on that topic. 
I think perhaps it's more readily recognised and acknowledged when you have nurses working specifically in case management roles, helping people navigate the system. I think what is less easy to describe is the more fluid processes that you see in the acute sector, but essentially it's the same kind of thing that's going on, I think, but nurses are managing multiple cases. I don't know quite where we get to in terms of what what language and way of describing this activity will 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 communicate it sufficiently to the public and ca- and capture the hearts and minds in order to kind of underline its importance but oh, sorry there's just someone ahead of you Jill I'll come to you next yes um, Sarah Ingleby lead nurse for acute care and hospital at night it was kind of adding to what John had just said up there which was sorry um, the articulation is really important for me because even when I go home and people say, what have you been doing all day? And you say, saving lives. Well, actually, I probably haven't seen a patient maybe even today or if I have, not very many, but I have done loads of other things that have been towards that. So to give me some of the language and the words that you've used is very important. And I think if that's just for the people who are really close and I do talk to them about that quite flippantly, how do, as John says, the general public know about this so to be given the words and to help us to be able to translate that for them and to know what we do will be really important I think so as they say when they come in and see it and they do often say wow you're so busy but what are you doing it will be quite nice to be able to have those words so it's really really vital thank you Jill it's Jill Heaton I'm the chief nurse of CMFT I think it's an interesting question that John asks around how do you persuade the public that what you're doing when you're not at the bedside is equally important and I think some of that is about how we do it and what we do and how we're perceived to be behaving sometimes because the public are relatively straightforward you know they come into a clinical area they see a cluster of nurses first of all why they're not with patients secondly what they're doing if they're making a lot of noise then they must be having a good time and they're not here to have a good time they're here to work so that can't be right you know so people make very quick judgments whether they're right or wrong i think if you then graft onto that somebody drinking a cup of tea or they've got a magazine on the desk and i'm not suggesting that's what happens but i have seen it so members of the public will have seen it very quickly people make an assumption that that is downtime and it's in the public view and therefore the public will decide that it's not worthy and it's not important and it's not what we should be doing so i think some of it is about how we conduct ourselves in the public arena how we do that collectively and how we do it individually and certainly whilst you know i am not an advocate of nurses stations on the you know the big ones on the wards I think if you go into the clinical area, into the bays, which we've seen on some of our wards, which reduces noise and does actually give a focus of attention, I think patients and their relatives actually do appreciate that the nurse is working, even though if they're not giving direct care, they can see that they're doing something important, like filling in patient records, making requests, etc. And I think sometimes it's about how we conduct our business equates to how we are then perceived um, and, and people never really get to the point of whether it's worthy or not they just decide on the face value and we're all guilty of that sometimes over there we're giving angela our exercise for the day here good for me thank you uh, nikki cullen professor of nursing here at manchester thanks i really enjoyed your talk um it's not my area at all but One way in which people have tried to describe and look at and examine what nurses do from a different angle or through a different lens from from yours is looking at decision making. And it seems to me that that is a really, really important way of capturing the kind of cognitive processes and the kinds of thought that's happening, whether it's happening at the patient's bedside or in the patient's home or it's happening in the nurse's station or wherever it's happening, rather than... um, thinking of work or being busy or not being busy what are people actually thinking about what are people actually you know planning when they're when they're away from from the bedside and what kinds of uh, information resources are they marshalling when they're doing that we did some work on decision making quite a, a long time ago now i think in the early 2000s and, and started to get at some of that stuff the real complexity and the magnitude and the 
the complexity of types of decisions that nurses are making all the time. So I think the kind of work aspect coupled with the, the, with the decision-making aspect I think is a real way of starting to unpack what nurses are doing and communicate it to the outside world. And I hadn't really thought about it before in, in, in this light, but I was thinking about there were some army recruitment um, adverts, I think, some, not, not that long ago, that tried to describe what people, what soldiers do if they were trying to get people to go into the army, because most of us wouldn't have a clue what soldiers are thinking about. But those adverts tried to get at what, so, the decisions that soldiers have to make. And you thought, oh, wow, I never thought that's what you did in the air. Oh, right, okay. And it makes you look at it and think about it in a slightly different light. So it's just <laughs> something to think about. Yes, the gentleman there. Hey, um, I, so I can't remember your name, but I thought you made a very interesting point. I'd just like to offer maybe a sort of an alternative view of... Um, Who are you? Where sorry, Morris Nagginson from University of Manchester. Um, I think, I think there's some validity in what you're saying, but um, I think as well we have to be careful about how we present as being constantly busy, constantly doing. Um, and the research that I undertook, but admittedly on community care, um, but where nurses presented themselves as busy, either by actually saying those words to the patients or by just the, the act of coming in, doing what needs to and getting out, that actually had an effect on them patients accessing care that they needed. So very often patients knew they needed psychological support, knew they needed social support, but because the nurse was busy, they never broached that with the nurses. And I mean never. And the primary reason for that was because they were busy. Sometimes they lacked the knowledge about it, etc. But being busy, being seen to be doing something, whether that's writing notes, whether that's doing care that we think is legitimate, isn't if we're doing that constantly, I don't think it's always actually a good way to, to go about. Um, and just to borrow very quickly from my own clinical practice where I work, sometimes in a hospice daycare centre, um, sitting there and sort of doing nothing with a cup of tea can actually be very effective with patients. And we see that as a luxury. But actually when we start thinking about the effect of the way in which we appear to be as this very efficient, I would almost sort of say Protestant work ethic thing, that, that has effects as well. Um, and I think we need to argue for that downtime. Now, maybe not downtime flicking through Hello Magazine, but there are ways of having downtime that are perfectly, I would say, morally important ways to act as nurses that, that maybe sort of start to detract from what you were going about. But, yeah. An important point. Davina, do you want to come back on it? Well, it's a, it's a, related, it's a related point. And, um, I mean, one of the things I want to emphasise is that I've very much try today to celebrate the value of this work. I'm not saying that it was unproblematic. I'm not saying that it wasn't more onerous than it needed to be. And one of the things that concerns me is that increasingly it's becoming the role of a specific nurse on a shift. And so what's happening is that the complexity and the volume of the organizing work is uncoupling the organizing from the clinical contact. So it's, it's uncoupling the knowledge bases on which that work Depends. So as a profession, we really have to get our act together, but in terms of recognising this work, developing our own technologies for making it more manageable and less onerous, cutting out all the superfluous stuff that isn't actually adding value, and I think that's true of a lot of it, and thinking very carefully about the sort of models of nursing organisation we need in the clinical areas so that we are not pulling ourselves constantly away from the bedside. Because in the study site, it was HCAs and the most junior nurses and the organisational aspects of patient care were being taken over by somebody else for very good reasons, because logistically it was very difficult to combine the two on a shift. Um, but we need to, th you know, we can't, we can't address that issue unless we acknowledge that there's all this stuff going on. So. Your next door neighbour had a question. Um, <clears throat> yes, my name's Karen Kemp. I'm a, a clinical academic nurse. I'm, I work at Central Manchester two days a week and then at the university three days a week. Um, and I'm a specialist nurse here. And I think it just follows on from the comment that Cheryl made. Um, <clears throat> that in terms of, of nursing is complex and the things that I do on a Monday, Tuesday is a whole range of things which are not necessarily at the patient bedside. And it's how to take those actions and how can we measure them and what the outcomes from them. So it's not just what the, pa what the patient sees, what the public sees, what, what our managers see. It's what is the essence of what we're actually doing and how can we measure it. So, for example, within specialist nurses, the role that I take, 
a lot of that is to do with vigilance and rescue therapy. So it does definitely have a value, but it's how can we measure it? Mm. And what is the outcome from those? And, and it ties back to how can we prove what we're doing is worth, you know, proving our worth what we're doing. Um, some work, you're probably familiar with it as a specialist nurse that you might want to look at is uh, by Alison Leary. She's done some fantastic, any of the rest of you as specialist nurses, some fantastic work on articulating the importance and value of specialist nurses because in so many areas they're being seen as too expensive and not adding value, but she's actually done some great work. It's well worth reading and citing. Over there. Uh, my name is Amanda Kelly. I'm a specialist nurse for Looked After Children. And I just wanted to echo this lady's comments because um, I've just recently finished my master's and the title of my master's is What, what Is It That Makes Us Special? Um, and it's quite timely that I've come to um, this, this lecture because it kind of reinforces that a lot of the work that we do do is that organising work and, and how is it that we're trying to evidence that rather than just the face-to-face -face contacts that we're having mm. every day. Um, I do work with quite complex hidden groups within society and I wondered if you know if that's something that would complement your work within the hospitals because you were talking before about you know caseload work and and how does that differ to um, sort of working on wards and stuff because my my work is very much caseload focused and you, you were saying before that um, you know a lot of the organizing work is approximately 70 percent of the time I, I would argue that mine is a probably a lot more than that, um, given the kind of clients group that I work with, really. So I just wanted to echo those comments. Yes, thank you for that. I mean, I, 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 I did kind of give the caveat when I started that this was, this was a study of organising work in the hospital context. And I think what we now need to do, if we take organising work seriously, is to think about what it looks like in other contexts, what it looks like, what's the proportion of it in different roles, and we can really start to get mm. to grips with it. Um, I did collect some data initially on community nursing, but <coughs> as I started to try and write this stuff up and analyse it, I realised that I couldn't describe what nurses were doing without describing the context in which they were working, and it was damn nigh impossible to describe the community and the hospital context at the same time. So because the data I had on community nurses was relatively limited, I've left that out. But I think, you know, I would, I would really, it would, it would feel as if I'd made a difference if people were to pick this up as a stream of research and run with it and look at it in other places. So. Go on then, Angela. I know I've got the mic, so that's... Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's nine-tenths of the law. Um, yeah, I just wanted to pick up on the, um, the nurse specialist bit because... Um, Last year, we, we uh, did a study on um, uh, lung cancer nurse specialists and access to treatment. And it was an interview-based study um, with observation within multidisciplinary teams. And nearly everything you said connected with what we observed happening. So in terms of the clinical nurse specialist and how their role um, uh, unfolds in the day-to-day -day world, um, of clinical practice, I can really see your, your analysis adding, adding some understanding. Um, so there are a couple of things I think I wanted to pick up on. First of all, uh, your issue about how do we demonstrate that. And I think one of the things is to try and find an outcome that really matters. Mm. And I think for, for um, us, the being able, we did have some national data that indicated in those centres where um, patients saw a lung cancer nurse specialist, they were twice as likely to get access to treatment. Our study was understanding what they were doing that made that happen. Uh, so I think it's linking what you do to an outcome that matters, I think, wow. is the first thing. And th the second thing that I'd like to say is that if there are any nurse specialists in the trust who would like to get together and talk about this, I think, and really try and Think, think that through about that work which is invisible, which, which is so crucial, then I'd be really up for that. So um, that's a, if anybody is interested. And Alison Leary is one of the Florence Nightingale Scholars, Indeed. and she'd be delighted to come up and join you as and part my, of that. My third point is related to Alison's work, which is about under pressure of caseload, it's the work that, that's left undone. Yeah. And I think that's another element about it, which is very um, important to look at. Yeah. I mean, sorry, just to, I'll come back to you, just to add to this, that, you know, there's been a lot of uh, media 
spotlight on the RN forecast study about nursing workloads and nursing numbers and work. And what particularly that study uh, looked at is when you're short of registered nurses, there's a whole raft of nurse, uh, nursing work that's left undone. But I've got a slide that I'll be showing next week at a conference on that, and 66% of the work that's left undone is communicating with patients. It's all this communication stuff, which is so important when people actually analyse and say they weren't compassionate, because it's the listening, it's the talking, it's the reassurance, it's the educating, it's the explaining. All of that stuff is in this box that's communication that, again, we leave out because we haven't got time to do it, the very point that you were, you were saying. Um, Anne, you wanted to make a point, then I suppose we ought to. Just to make the point, really, just to say, first of all, I'm a hospital nurse. Um, that's my context and my background. But increasingly, I find myself trying to take the position of people who work in communities. Um, and I can't stress strongly enough the need for us to understand better what nurses in community settings are doing. It's fine in hospitals in many ways. We don't quite measure things in the same way. We're being driven towards a model of caseload that's based on visits in, in community nursing. Visits as a measurement is not going to pick up the things that you're talking about. And it makes me really, really concerned, particularly when I hear the specialist nurses, where there are some parallels, I think, talking about the work that's not done. Mm. Absolutely. Ooh. Okay, uh, one more question over there. Gentlemen, you're the final. Um, yes, I think we do have challenge. There's no, there's no doubt about that. I mean, I think my um, I, my response is, 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 firstly, I mean, I guess we have to we we have to be politically more savvy. But the real in, on the day, in the day job, we have to function in the systems in which we find ourselves. Um, one of the things I would say about the value of I think, or one of the consequences of what I've done here, is to start to enable us to, to resist and think more carefully about the sorts of management technologies that are being thrust upon us that look like solutions to the challenges that we're facing and actually just clutter up the workplace even more. Um, they look like shiny solutions, and I would, I, but they're not. And I, and I guess my, my ideal would be if nurses were actually to start to reclaim these practices and this knowledge for themselves and then start to say what technologies and... Um, support do we need in order to do these things better? I think I don't think you're going to lose the need for organisational work in nursing. Um, it's an organisationally embedded profession. It's grown up with the growth of the modern hospital, so we're always going to have those pressures around us. But, I, you know, if we're working in difficult times, I accept that. Well, I'm going to leave it to my colleague Jill, Jill Heaton, your Director of Nursing, to sum up. And to th but thank you, Davina, from me. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks. Thanks for that, Liz. And, and particular, particular thank you to you, Davina. Um, incredible food for thought. Um, fascinating perspective. Um, and I think it really just, just crystallised what we do, the breadth and the range and the scope of our practice, whichever field you're in. Um, and it's not surprising that we go home tired in the evening, really, is it? Um, it's a very simple way of putting all of that in a nutshell. Um, a particular thank you to Liz uh, for coming up from London today uh, and battling through. I don't know what weather it's like down there, but certainly where I live, we've got three inches of snow and I've had it since Friday, so uh, it's quite nice to come to Manchester. <laughs> it's just a mere rainfall. Um, but for your... 
personal and professional support for our chair. Um, it's a really, really privileged position and we shouldn't underestimate it, uh, having the badge of the Florence Nightingale Foundation. Um, we're one of seven. And just to emphasise what Liz said at the, the outset, the Cambridge chair, some of you will know, is Christy, Christy Deaton, who was with us and was Angela's predecessor. And having trained up Christy the best as we could, we've sent her off to Cambridge now to do missionary work. So we, she'll keep in touch and let us know how she gets on. But uh, she's taken everything good from here and she will, I have no doubts, grow it uh, and flourish in Cambridge. But before I wind up uh, this section, um, the most important people here today are you as our audience. And I want to thank you personally for taking the time out of a very busy schedule. Our colleague at front said, you know, we're all busy. We're all busy, busy, busy. You know, you can't afford not to be busy now, can you? You know, and our social lives busy, our home lives, our work lives, everything's busy. Uh, and the world we live in has made technology instant and everybody expects an instant response. So that just winds up the busy levels even more so. So thank you for taking the time out. It is a busy time of year. Uh, it's January, it's winter, the pressure's on, particularly those of you who are working in direct care on the wards. I know exactly how that feels, so thank you for taking that time. But one of the things I just did want to mention, whilst uh, I've just got you for two or three minutes, is just to take a moment to reflect on being a nurse, because I think it is important uh, we've talked about what everybody perceives of us, and I wasn't suggesting for a second that you couldn't have a cup of tea. It was just don't have it as a big group and don't have a big laugh in front of everybody else. Just go and do it privately. Uh, but I have no problems with people having a break. Um, but, you know, just think about that privileged position that we hold. And those of you who work in the Trust will have heard me say this before. But, you know, we are amongst a very, very rare and unique set of individuals professionally who are given that privileged access to patients and families and their carers and individuals, clients in the community, whether in the acute or other sectors, at their most vulnerable times, at the beginning of life and probably more importantly at the end of life. And whilst we can't necessarily influence the outcome of what's going to happen, we can actually make a difference. We can make that outcome and that experience better for those families and that patient. And the number of people who I've had experience of thank me directly and thank me for the care of staff in the hospital for making what was a tragic set of events better for them and more tolerable. And it's all the stuff that we do that Davine has described that gives us the opportunity and the experience and the knowledge and the expertise to do that without even thinking about it. But we can make a difference even in tragic circumstances and we can help families and patients through very, very difficult times through our care and through our input and through our compassion and our kindness. And we all know when we're on the receiving end of those qualities what that feels like. And we all know what it feels like when you're not on the receiving end of it. So remember the day you took on the badge of being a nurse and how proud you felt. And when you wore that uniform for the first time and you thought, yeah, you just bristled a bit. You didn't mind have let on. You might not have just disclosed that to anybody. But I'd be very surprised if there's anybody who did that for the first time and thought, oh, it's a load of crap, this. <laughs> and yet, we hear that. We hear that now from our professional colleagues. And what do we do to people? And what do we do to each other to tire them out? and to get them to a point where they feel it's okay to say to patients and their families, do you know, it's really hard on this ward, and I haven't had a break, and so-and-so's been off sick for three weeks, and nobody's dealing with that, and you know, not, they've not done the off duty for next week. And we share that openly with our patients and their families, and then we wonder why they get anxious, and they think we're too busy to care. So sometimes it's how we conduct ourselves, and how we articulate all of that, 
subliminally as well as overtly that makes our patients feel confident and trust us and respect our judgment and know that we have got their best interests at heart. We're entering a really difficult period now in terms of a run-up to the election and you would have to be living in a cave for, not, for the NHS not to be on the front page of whatever we're doing. And I just think it's worth recognising that we are the NHS whether we like it or we identify with it or not, we are it. Yeah? So when people look at us and they judge the profession and they judge the NHS, they are looking at us and we have an opportunity to impact and to make that perception better. So just think about that and try not to be drawn into those difficult conversations, those political conversations, because you will be quoted. Remember what you're going to say because it will be held up and it will be used as evidence against us, and I am completely apolitical. I don't care who gets in, because I think they're all a shower at the end of the day, but don't quote me on that. Um, but it is a difficult time for us as a profession, and like Davina said at the beginning, you know, we are the fallen angels. You know, gone are the days when we had that ticket that just saying you're a nurse, Almost, it was like a party in the Red Sea. It was come through. You're wonderful. People want to challenge us now. They want to know what we're doing. They want to know how we're doing it, why we're doing it. Public expectation has changed. You know, we are a service industry. And the new generation coming through don't have a level of gratefulness about having the NHS like the older generation had. They have an expectation. They have an instant recognition of what's good and what's bad and what they expect and how quickly they expect it and what standard they expect it to be delivered at. So not surprisingly, sometimes we're having to play catch up. And I don't make any apologies for that, but I just think we need to recognise it because we are a very transparent, very public service who are trying to do our best under very difficult circumstances very often and under a lot of pressure and feeling quite under-resourced and undervalued. So I do recognise that, but just try and keep that at the front of your mind when you're out there practising, because it is a bit like being on the stage. But more importantly, we should not make any apologies for seeking knowledge and expertise. We should not apologise for being a graduate profession. Why should we? Like Liz said, why should we? What's wrong with being a graduate profession? I was with a bunch of chief executives last Friday, he said to me, you know, Jill, you don't really think they should all be graduates, do you? I said, well, actually I do, yes. And they were really shocked, because I think they thought we were in a little secret enclave and I would disclose what I really thought. And that is what we're up against. You know, nobody would ever dream of saying, well, they don't think doctors should be graduates, do we? Don't think physios should be graduates. But somehow it's all right for us not to be one. So I just think, again, you know, we just need to be ready to stand up, be counted, don't be passive, and remember, at the centre of everything we do, day in, day out, whatever field you're in, we are advocates for our patients, and nobody else can take that role, because that is ours, we have made it ours, we deserve it, we conduct ourselves, we execute it in an exemplary way, 99.9% .9 of the time and I think we should congratulate ourselves and be proud of what we do and thank you for what you do and what you're going to do and what you continue doing day in day out in often difficult circumstances. Thank you. There's just one, one remaining or two remaining things to say. Uh, we've got a cup of tea downstairs, so thank you for your forbearance. It should have been here at the beginning, but we, we didn't quite get it all right, so there's one at the end. Uh, and the second thing is, we've got a series of lectures. This is our first one, of which we're very proud, and thank you again, Davina. But the next one is on the 12th of May, and the venue will be in the G. McFarlane building in the university, and it's Dr. Elaine Maxwell from Southbank University, who will be speaking on putting safety at the heart of care. I hope to see you there. Thank you. <laughs>